leg. Oh my god. My leg. Sarah, get a gurney. Get a gurney. Code red. What are you saying? He's floating. He's floating. What's your name? What's your name? Help. Help. Health South Incorporated. Let's see his vitals. The patient we just witnessed is Health South. As you saw, Health South is in very poor condition, at risk of complete demise. But before you can understand how Health South got to its current state, first, you have to understand who Health South is. Health South is the nation's largest provider of healthcare services. Founded in 1984, based out of Birmingham, Alabama, it soon went public in 1986. Shortly after, Health South became the largest provider of inpatient and outpatient healthcare services on a nationwide basis. By 2000, it operated more than 2,000 rehabilitation facilities, surgery centers, and related medical sites throughout the U.S., United Kingdom, and Australia. The company maintained a high market share to foster a competitive advantage. Health South's company objective is to continue to grow profitably and enhance its position as the preferred provider in its lines of business and geographic markets. During this time period, the healthcare industry was growing immensely in outpatient services like outpatient rehab centers and outpatient surgery centers. HealthSouth was at the top of this industry. However, HealthSouth was competing within the entire healthcare industry, which is one of the largest and most complex. HealthSouth was also faced with new competitors introducing innovative and technologically advanced products into the industry. The industry had the ability to easily turn HealthSouth customers and suppliers away through providing lower prices. These factors put HealthSouth under a lot of pressure to separate itself from other competitors and to maintain a high profitability. Meanwhile, HealthSouth planned to continue providing high-quality services with advanced technology while practicing cost-effectiveness. Anyway, let's get back to the rehab center. Okay, now HealthSouth, are there any potential risk factors in your history we should be aware of? Well. There's three things, three big things. Pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. Our patient is right. The fraud triangle put HealthSouth at major risk for fraud. First and foremost, Richard Scushi, the founder and CEO, was a source of great pressure. He was both greedy and controlling. He lived a large lifestyle and had pressure to maintain it. When at risk of not meeting earnings targets, Scrooge would scream at top executives, bring up potential lawsuits, lost jobs, or reputations. Reporting bad numbers was simply not an option. Scrooge asserted the same pressure towards the auditors. If the auditors asked for a general ledger, he would threaten them with finding a replacement. Opportunity for fraud was everywhere. Internal controls were virtually non-existent. And even worse, management override of the controls was all too common. Hell South lacked adequate oversight by the board of directors, they did not have a formal document and retention policy, and they did not properly monitor executives. Finally, this was all rationalized as beneficial to the company's success and growth. Often the fraudsters saw their adjustments as simply creative accounting rather than straight up fraud. This set the stage for a perfect storm. Good to know, and how long have these internal issues been happening? For a while now, but I haven't really told anyone. It all started in 1996. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we flash back into 1996, let me introduce you to the perpetrators. While 17 people were convicted, there were four main fraudsters. Let's meet them. First, we have Richard Scrooge. Bad guy. He was the real mastermind behind this. As the founder and CFO, he was such a personable guy. I mean, who else can convince Wall Street to bring a two-year-old company public? Next, Aaron Bean. He was the first CFO and co-founder with Richard. With Richard's pressure, he started to cook the books with his controller. Knowing this was wrong, he resigned a year after. Then, Bill Owens, another bad apple. He was the controller who cooked the books with Aaron Bean. He later became CFO at some point. Finally, we have Weston Smith. He too became a CFO at some point, and after he was so tired of lying, he went to the FBI and laid out the fraud for him. Although Weston was the first whistleblower, the FBI had already begun investigating due to red flags that were raised over insider trading. Anyway, let's get back to 1996. Richard, I don't know how to put this, but our earnings are down. We're not going to meet our analyst projections this year. What? Absolutely not. 
If we don't meet our projections, then our stock price is going to go down. I'm going to be the richest man in this state, and you don't become the richest man in this state by having low stock prices. Y'all are going to fix this. You're going to do whatever it takes. Well, the only way to do that would be to make fake entries. Does it look like I give it? Do whatever it takes, or you guys aren't going to be the rock stars you are anymore. You better be good at it, too, because being in a Fortune 500 company like this, it's a bit like being in the mafia. You don't just walk away. Here's how it all went down. In the early stages were the manipulation of balance sheet accounts that involved great areas of judgments, like bad debts and net receivables. The executives rationalized that these were gray areas and could be manipulated. Then they started capitalizing startup costs through small acquisitions, which were basically buying future earnings by making these small acquisitions and capitalizing costs to expense over time. Another big area was through large company acquisitions, like big multi-million dollar deals. There was a lot of aggressive and fraudulent accounting with those numbers. They would create every liability you could imagine and put them into an opening entry under assumed debt and pretty much build up reserve accounts. Then, as earnings were not met, Hell South had reserves to bleed off the balance sheet to make up for it. Finally, it got to a point where executives were just making stuff up, like creating assets and entries that didn't exist. Each quarter, they would make small enough false entries to avoid detection by auditors. And during the height of the fraud, it took about 126,000 fraudulent entries each quarter. Unfortunately, these schemes were kept well disguised and the auditors were unaware of the fraud. Look, we need to make our earnings look better. I just don't feel comfortable with fake numbers. But you did say whatever it takes. Well, I mean, they don't have to be all fake numbers. Uncollectible receivables is a huge judgment. And there's nothing really wrong with being overconfident. That's a good plan. We could do something with the contractual adjustments, and we could even boost revenue. Startup costs are easy to move around, and no one really looks at those anyway. After a couple of years of doing this and getting better at it, they began to get more confident and bold. Richard just won't let up. This is getting harder and harder. We need to think bigger. Hmm. What about valuations? Especially with that new company we just got? We can easily overvalue it, and the goodwill will inflate on the balance sheet. It doesn't matter if the company is actually worth it or not. That's good. That's a start. But we still need more. We can't tie in anything else. We're going to have to make fake numbers. Remember, Richard told them, whatever it takes. There's obviously something wrong. We just can't find anything. We did all the procedures. Health South will be fine. We could just ignore it. I need to talk to the doctor right now. I'm Mr. Smith. I heard you need to talk to me. Yes, I have information on Health South that I think you need to know. Okay, I'll take a look over this and look at his charts. After looking at the financial statements, we analyzed the numbers and developed a few charts to show our findings. Wow, what a difference between the revenues Health South originally reported in 2000 and 2001 versus the restated numbers. You can see that Health South inflated revenues by 16.6% .6 in 2000 and by 18.89% .8 in 2001. You can see that by 1998, the intangibles grew to almost two times what they were in 1996. This is a huge jump that should have been a red flag for the auditors. After the restatement, intangible assets were reduced to $1.4 billion. This is Health South's percent of intangible assets to total assets compared to one of their competitors. This also shows how overstated the assets were, and you can see that it was not normal to have this many intangible assets. This is the percent of bad debt expense to net AR. You can also see with this chart that Health South's percent is much lower than their competitor. This is because they falsely wrote off the bad debt to increase their income. Finally, we have the summary of the restated items that were filed in Health South's 2003 10K. You can see there were many different aspects of fraud. The auditor could have performed simple but powerful tools to uncover these red flags and discover the fraud. Okay, Health South, I've figured out what's wrong with you. I don't know how the original audit missed all of these deficiencies, but I'm glad I got to the bottom of it. We have found massive fraud all over your system. No wonder you were failing. The combination of the progress factors and internal control deficiencies were the root causes. We can now see why management collusion makes fraud difficult for the audit function to find. 
Believe it or not, Richard Scucci did not serve any jail time in connection with this fraud. However, many of the other Hell South executives were sentenced to varying jail times. These charges represent the first fraud against executives under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. What's the worst part? Hell South's $2.8 billion accounting scandal and all its repercussions could have easily been avoided.